Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kohler Group's Expansion into China webinar series. The topic for today is China Corporate Compliance, Updates and Tips for Securing One's China Investment. This is part eight of 10 webinar sessions that Kohler Group is hosting to help foreign companies and foreign investors with their market entry and expansion within the Chinese territory. Today's topic, China Corporate Compliance, is geared towards companies that are already registered in China. Compliance is a headache for any investor. However, complying with Chinese laws and regulations can be a major difficulty for any company doing business in China, particularly with the language and cultural barriers. The endless introductions of new laws, regulations, circulars, guidelines, followed by a variety of interpretations of these documents by central and local governments, as well as corporate service providers, lawyers, accountants, auditors, can create a compliance nightmare for any executive and any company doing business in China. Failure to ensure corporate compliance can carry penalties and a poor standing with the various government bureaus. This webinar is directed at the individuals within companies like the company secretaries, administrators, in-house counsels or finance officers responsible for the operation and compliance of the China entity. In this webinar, we'll be looking at, at up, providing you updates on the compliance regulations and tips on general entity and document management in China. However, before we begin today's presentation, I would just like to make sure that the sound system is functioning and you can all hear me. If you would be so kind as to click the hand button in the control panel, that will allow me to know that you can hear me. If I am having any audio difficulties, please don't exit the webinar. The audio will soon appear again. It will just take a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds for it to reappear, and it's usually because of the instability of the internet line. If you have any audio difficulties, please note that there's an audio section in your control panel, and you can switch it from mic and speakers to telephone and use your landline to get back into the session. Now, as is typical with any webinar uh, at Kohler Group, we do enjoy having our interactive Q&A session, so if you do have questions or comments, please do insert them into the question section of the control panel. For those of you that are new to Kohler Group, allow me to introduce who we are. Kola Group is a CSC company. We have 10 offices located in three jurisdictions in Asia, primarily in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. We've been established since 1979 and have over 120 professionals that are located throughout the 10 offices. Our objective is to help foreign investors with their market entry and expansion within the three jurisdictions that we operate in. The main service lines cater to all administrative and compliance functions associated with incorporating an entity within those jurisdictions. One of our unique advantages is that we do speak over 10 languages internally and are able to communicate with our clients uh, in their mother tongue. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina Kola Kaluccia. I'm a director at Kola Group and I will be the speaker for today's session. I've been working for Kohler Group since 2003 when I first joined or opened the Shanghai office. Since then, I have expanded our operations in China to include eight offices and have been helping a number of foreign investors with their market entry, their expansion, their local operations, and in some instances, their liquidations from the Chinese market. At Kohler Group, we publish a number of online resources through our magazine, through our alerts, and all of these resources are complimentary, and we have a weekly e-newsletter that can be subscribed to on our homepage, on our website, and if you're interested in receiving all these updates, please don't hesitate to insert your email address into the section called China Invest.biz Information Series, um, and, and you will then begin to be subscribed. So let us begin with today's presentation. 
As mentioned, we're looking at corporate compliance related issues for companies that are already registered in the Chinese market. Now the first half of this presentation is looking at expansion within the Chinese market or the overall restructuration of your company in China. Now a key component here is you may have decided to establish your main entity in China in Shanghai, but as your business grows and your business expands, you may want to expand into other cities within the Chinese market. So you may have started off in Shanghai and now you want to have people on the ground in Chengdu, in Chongqing, in Beijing, in Guangzhou, in Shenzhen, in Xi'an, in Wuhan, in Wuxi, etc. Now, here I've listed some key considerations about opening a branch office. But before we begin that, let's start off by defining what a branch office is or a branch company is in China. There are two types. There's an operational branch company and there is a non-operational branch company. An operational branch company basically means that although you are not dependent, you are tied to your parent company, which would be, in this instance, the Shanghai company. You've opened up the company in Wuhan. To be operational means that this entity is capable of doing all the finance issues on its own, meaning it can issue VAT invoices in the name of the branch company. It will have its own finance department because it will need to do accounting locally. Um, it will need to do tax filing locally, primarily because it is transactional. It's invoicing in its own company name. Naturally, with any branch company, consolidation will have to occur with the Shanghai company uh, at the end of each month. A non-operational branch company, if you are familiar with all the terms used when incorporating in China, for me, a non-operational branch company is identical to a representative office, meaning that the non-operational branch company is 100% tied to the Shanghai company, meaning it cannot do invoicing in its own company name. All the invoicing is centralized through the Shanghai company. The non-operational branch company is purely there for marketing purposes, quality control inspections, and ultimately to house all the employees that are based in that city. Now, I get a lot of questions uh, in relation to branch companies and how to operate them. And, you know, most companies, foreign investors, are always looking for loopholes to minimize their costs um, and, and minimize uh, the amount of compliance work that needs to occur in China. So I've, I've listed here four of the main questions that I get asked. The first one is, if I'm just employing one person in another city, do I have to register a branch company? Now, one person is always a gray area because the question then comes to, is this one person going to be working from home? And most of the time, in 99% of the cases, the answer is yes. So ultimately, you don't need to have a registered office address in that city where the branch company should be located. In addition, this one person will be working from home, but ultimately, if it is a so-called marketing and sales office, most likely this one person won't be always sitting at home. They'll be traveling throughout that region of China to sell, to market the products. Now, in a scenario like this, it is not 100% legal to not have a branch company. In order to be completely transparent, regarding, regardless of the quantity of staff you have, you must register a branch company. But I understand the budgeting concerns that companies have when going into China. And if you have just a one-person office, the guy is working from home, he's traveling most of the time, I could almost tell you, listen, why don't you just have this person under the payroll of your Shanghai company and leave it at that? But the minute that you grow to two people, register a branch company. Don't wait around for somebody to basically denounce you. Now, what's the worst case scenario that can happen? The worst case scenario is that this one person, if you fire him because he's not showing you results, he can easily go to the Administration of Industry and Commerce, go to the Labor Arbitration Bureau and say, I've been fired, but just to let you know, this company has not been 100% uh, 
uh, registered in this city where I am actually located. So there are a lot of risks surrounding that in terms of you know, what this person can denounce you for. Now with any branch company, and in fact with any company that is registered in China, you need to have a registered office address. So you do have to, if you're registering the branch company similar to a, a normal limited company, you need to have a business scope, you need to have a registered office address, you need to have a legal representative of that branch company, um, etc. So you do have to have to rent an office space um, and have that office listed within the license of the branch company. The business scope of a branch company must follow the business scope of the Shanghai entity. Now let me give you some examples. If you have a manufacturing company in Shanghai and you want to now establish a branch company in order for that branch company to do sales and marketing for the products that are, that are manufactured, the branch company is not actually going to be producing anything. So the business scope can be reduced to just the technical service, the sales, uh, etc. Now if you have a trading company in Shanghai and all of a sudden you want to do manufacturing in Hangzhou, it is not possible to extend the business scope for a branch company, meaning you would have to set up a brand new entity in Hangzhou in order to be able to do manufacturing. So to give you an order of size in terms of uh, activities within the business scopes, a service company usually has the least amount of services or activities listed. Trading company is the next level. Manufacturing is the last level in terms of being able to do manufacturing, trading, and service. So going from service to trading, you can add on from manufacturing down, uh, not an issue in terms of, of, of setting up the branch. Now with any company that you register in China, whether it's a limited, a rep office, or a branch, you have to do accounting, tax, and payroll, plus other compliance issues that we'll go through in this webinar. Keep that in mind, because that does increase the amount of administration work that is involved. The next item where I talk about restructuring and, and the bigger picture, because you're already established in China, is the transfer of shares of an LLC. Now, historically, in order to speed up the process of establishing a limited, a foreign invested limited company in China, what a lot of foreign investors did, because as is typical, uh, the minute they approach their lawyer or their ser corporate service provider, they should have been established yesterday, right? And knowing at that point then that it takes maybe four to six months to establish a company, they start freaking out because they're going to lose business. So as a consequence, what do they do? They have their local employee establish a domestically registered LLC or a domestically invested uh, uh, enterprise, a DIE. And eventually, once that's up and running, they will do a transfer of shares because the share, the share transfer process does not halt the ongoing business that is occurring within that entity. But what a lot of companies don't realize is the additional compliance that's required or the additional documentation that's required when doing a, a share transfer. The first is you need a share transfer agreement. You need to settle on a price. How do you settle on a price? Well, usually you have to do an evaluation report. The evaluation report should be issued by a company that does real estate and asset appraisals. This evaluation report then needs to be approved by the tax officer in charge of the transfer of shares to make sure that the final price in relation to the sale of this company is correct. Now, obviously in order to reduce uh, any impact in terms of sale, you want to be able to sell the company prior to being profitable. And hopefully you can just sell the company then at the registered capital amount. But all of this process of transferring the shares of an LLC does take the same quantity of time as if you were going to establish a newly registered LLC in China. Again, 
things that people don't always realize is the nitty-gritty details involved uh, with each compliance issue that you want to do. So this transfer of shares, again, this is, this is really, I'm, I'm highlighting this more for foreign investors that are going into China and are doing internal sales of that company. If you're doing an external sales and you're actually selling the company to an external party or a third party, well, then it makes sense that you need to evaluate the price of your company. But if you're doing an internal sales, be aware of all of this that has to occur um, instead of just setting up the new company um, and waiting it out. Now, something that's not so positive is the fact that many companies in China have not been successful. And it is important prior to entering the market to understand what is the liquidation process of an LLC. I believe it's a particularly important to understand what is the closure process of a representative office because there are a lot of companies today who are expanding their operations and moving or, or so-called converting their operations from a representative office to a limited company. Now liquidating an LLC, let's just begin with time frame. It can take from anywhere between 18 to 24 months to complete the entire process. The liquidation of an LLC requires that the company formulate a liquidation committee. This liquidation committee signs off on all the documents required for submission. The first step within the liquidation is doing an audit, uh, usually looking at the last three years of operation and analyzing whether there's any tax liability that is owed by the company. Once the audit is completed, the tax bureau will then do their own search through their records within the establishment, within the history of the establishment of the LLC. Um, and usually this step alone can take up to one year with back and forth communication with the tax officer. Once the tax bureau confirms the liquidation of the LLC and all tax liabilities have been paid and owed, the remaining steps are relatively quick and smooth. With a representative office and converting that into an LLC, using the word conversion is probably not correct because you cannot convert, so to speak, a rep office to an LLC. You would actually need to close down the representative office and open an LLC. The biggest dilemma that most foreign investors incur when going through this process is the fact that you cannot have two companies registered within one address, which means that you cannot have your representative office located in one office and your new LLC that you're incorporating located in that same office. So. In actual fact, what we recommend to a lot of clients is to move the representative office registered address to a business center for the period of closure, and the LLC will open in within or have the registered office address where you are actually operational. Liquidating a company, closing down a rep office, setting up an LLC thereafter requires a tremendous amount of planning, and you need to be fully aware. I have never had a case of a liquidation of an LLC that hasn't required additional compliance steps first before even starting the liquidation. For example, are all of your accounts receivables settled? Are all your accounts payable settled? Have you terminated all employees? Have you sold all of your fixed assets? A lot of preparation needs to occur before you can even start the liquidation. Now, these last three slides have really been about the bigger picture. We're going to look now into the smaller picture. What needs to occur on an annual basis for a company to remain compliant in the Chinese market? Now, the first step is doing the annual inspection, the annual report. This is a requirement for a limited company as well as a representative office. For both types of entities, the deadline for submission is June 30th. In most cities, the annual inspection, annual report can be submitted online. What is the purpose of this? Basically, it is a statistical analysis provided by the various government bureaus 
to see what is the status of companies, foreign invested companies in China. Are companies foreign, are foreign invested companies growing in the market? And there are questions there associated with the quantity of payroll, uh, the people that are on your payroll, um, transactional items, and comparing it year to year. So the annual inspection annual report is very important, but you have to be able to submit this document after having done all the financial compliance procedures that are required for every company. And that includes the year-end audit reports, that includes the annual profits tax filings, that includes the annual individual income tax filings. So all of these steps related to the finance aspect of the company have to be done first before going into the corporate compliance issues. Now, I've listed here a number of, of questions, again, that I get asked a lot by companies in relation to the annual inspection reports. Now, what happens if there are delays? What happens if you forget to do it? Or if it doesn't become a priority and you realize the day before? Now, if there is any type of delay, ideally, you should be contacting the Bureau in order to ask for an extension. That, that would be the best and most transparent way. So if you believe that there is going to be a delay, try to reach out to the bureaus a week to two weeks prior to say we're, we're delayed because all of the financial compliance work hasn't been completed yet. Uh, we need to get that done before we can submit the annual inspection or the annual report. Now if one does not complete the annual report, the consequence is that you are blacklisted within the administration of industry and commerce. This is important. You don't want to have a, you don't want to be put on the blacklist. It takes so much more work and effort to remove yourself from the blacklist. And it causes the administration of industry and commerce to supervise you more often to see whether you are compliant. And really, you don't want to have this bureau on your back. As mentioned, the annual inspection and report is done online in most cities in China. Um, and the last point is in relation to site inspections. Now, limited liability companies don't usually get inspected. It's, it's very rare for them to get an inspection after an annual report is concluded. Representative offices, on the other hand, they tend to do surprise site inspections. Now, we had a case in Shenzhen where uh, the staff of this office, of this rep office, are usually not in the office, they're traveling around. And as a consequence, when the government officer came to the office, nobody was there, nobody could open the door, nobody could meet with him. And it is a regulation for the officers to close the doors of the rep office uh, until a meeting can be had. So for a period of about seven working days, the staff members of that office could not enter uh, into, into the office at all until they had a formal meeting at the offices of the Administration in, of Industry and Commerce. So again, you know, uh, my recommendation for rep offices is that either you really have to have a secretary or a receptionist um, always located within the office to make sure in case there's any surprise visit, somebody is there to greet the individual, or to be located within a business center location where you know there's always somebody at the reception desk that can greet somebody if there is any type of surprise visit. Now, business license and registration certificate renewals is extremely important and can be now nowadays really easily forgotten. The term of a limited liability company in China is anywhere from a minimum of 10 years up to 50 years. Six months prior to the end of the term, you need to go through a formal renewal process. Now, obviously, when you have a minimum of 10 years and a maximum of 50 years, you've really got to put it in your calendar to make sure that six months prior you start the renewal process. Otherwise, you might find out one day that your license has been completely uh, uh, terminated and revoked. And ultimately, if you don't renew it, you are blacklisted within the Chinese government. For a representative office, 
the validity term of a representative office can be anywhere between three and five years, depending on uh, where that rep office is located. In order to do the renewal process, you do need to have the parent company's documents notarized by the Chinese embassy um, or by a China designated notary. This is extremely important um, and basically the whole reason behind this notarization of these company documents is to verify that the company overseas is legitimate, that it is not fake. So um, I know that the notarization process in some countries can take up to four to six weeks, which is why, again, a lot of planning is required when going through the renewal processes. Um, but it is a way for the Chinese government to make sure that everything that you say regarding your structure in China is correct and is legitimate. Now, last year in this presentation, I highlighted a change in the certificates related to uh, uh, a limited liability company in China. This year, or as of October 2016, a further change has been made in that now you have a five-in-one business license. Now, prior there was the three-in-one business license and prior to that there was just licenses from every single bureau. Now, what is really nice is that during the application of a company of, or, or even a branch um, is that when you do your application with the Administration of Industry and Commerce as well as the MOFCOM, only one business license, one license is actually issued. This license has a USCC code, a Unified Social Credit Code, and this code is utilized for all the government bureaus in that location where you are established, which means that once your license, what we call today the, the five-in-one business license is issued, you um, have that license recorded within all the five government bureaus. So there are no additional steps thereafter that have to be done. Um, this, is, this is a wonderful new system. Uh, as of October 1st, 2016, it went from the three-in-one license to the five-in-one, meaning that two additional bureaus were added into the list. Um, it, it, it's, it, for me, I think this is a great development that has occurred. Uh, it's just for all companies that are already existing in China, um, just note uh, to make sure you do the filing with the Administration of Industry and Commerce uh, in order to make sure that it's been upgraded uh, to the five-in-one one business license. Now, I'm going to be looking on this slide at the bigger picture of compliance in China. What people need to be aware of is renewals of licenses and contracts. And this is a key point in relation to your audits that you need to get done at the end of each uh, fiscal year. Now, you may be in a sector where you require special licenses. So, for example, you need an ICP license, you need a food and beverage license, you need an accounting license, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These licenses also need to be renewed on an annual basis. Uh, the accounting license, for example, I can tell you firsthand, needs to be renewed on an annual basis. There is a series of documentation that needs to be submitted to prove that you are still in the accounting industry sector, um, and from that point on, you get the new certificate on an annual basis. Trademark licenses also have a term of validity, and six months prior to the end date of that validity, you do need to renew your trademark. Again, something you shouldn't forget because the trademark is critical in doing any type of business in China. Contracts with suppliers, contracts with customers, contracts with third-party providers. All of this, you need to have somebody in-house who is checking that these contracts are up to date, are valid, particularly if you're continuing that relationship with that party. Lease agreements. Again, make sure your lease agreement is valid and updated. This is critical because it's associated with your registered office address that is listed on your business license. If you update it, you need to update your, uh, your registered address on your license. Employment contracts. We had an excellent webinar yesterday in relation to uh, how to employ people legally in China and how to dismiss them. Employment contracts, employee handbooks 
are vital for running your operation. Making sure your employment contracts are updated and renewed is also extremely important. The list goes on. Now, obviously, a key concern for many is, well, we're starting off in China. We have a small operation, maybe one, maybe five people. I'm not going to hire someone internally to just review all the documents and licenses that need to be renewed. Well, you can have a lawyer or a law firm um, do this for you. So if you have a law firm that is formulating contracts on your behalf, ask them, can you please let us know or can you please send us a notification when the contracts have to be renewed? Um, you can also have somebody in your home jurisdiction if you have, let's say, an in-house counsel or an in-house compliance team um, sitting in Germany, sitting in the US, sitting in Canada, sitting in the UK, etc. Utilize that department to inform you about what needs to be updated. But make sure somebody does it. Otherwise, you will forget and it will harm your business in the long run. Now, updates to the Articles of Association. This is also extremely important. Any change, and I've, I highlighted this actually in the first webinar that occurred, your Articles of Association are a vital piece of documentation. The Articles of Association basically are your company bylaws. All the details listed within the company bylaws must be current in order for them to be valid, in order for the document to be valid. As a consequence, anything about registered office address changes, corporate structural changes, registered capital increases, uh, changes within the uh, powers of attorney for people that are within the corporate structure have to be updated. Um, all of these functions are critical and must be updated. And anytime an update is created, you have to make sure that the uh, board resolution or executive director resolution is attached. You also have to make sure that the final approval from the Administration of Industry and Commerce and the MOFCOM are added so that you have a complete file of your original AOA and you have all the updates then uh, following it. All of these documents must be kept on file. There is no requirement in China to keep a book of minutes or to keep uh, or to hire a compliance officer or any of that. So again, it's vital to have somebody be in control of all of these amendments that are being made throughout the history of your entity. Now, in the past, um, when companies registered in China, they had to provide a feasibility study report. This feasibility study report is no longer required today when establishing a company. A question I used to get from a lot of companies um, in relation to their feasibility study reports was, is the government ever going to track my business plan and penalize me if I don't reach certain milestones or certain things that I had promised within the feasibility study report? The feasibility study report is just that. It is whether your company is feasible for doing business in China. It's a business plan. It doesn't always have to work, which is why a lot of companies exit the market and liquidate. Um, and I think for this reason, with the new company laws that were issued, it's no longer required to have the feasibility study report. Really what the government is looking at is making sure that you have enough capital to start off your business um, and, um, and sustain your business over the long term. Change of registered office address, really something that's critical. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, changing your office address is a complete nuisance. Um, but it has to get done because there is the regulation of one office address is one legally registered company. Virtual office concepts don't exist in China. Now, um, let me go through a series of four implications. Implication one, implication of having your off registered office address as not your operational office. This is really taboo, uh, not allowed, illegal in China. Your registered office address should be your operational office. If you are locating your office within the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, because you want to take advantage of the preferential policies there, but you have a downtown office, in reality, you should be registering that downtown office as a branch company of your entity in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. So if you have any offices 
outside of your registered office address that are operational, have people on them, you need to be registering a branch company, as highlighted on the first slide from today. Implications of changing your registered office address. There are huge implications, particularly if you are moving your address from one district in Shanghai, let's say, to another district in Shanghai. So let's use examples. You currently have your office located in Jing'an district. You want to move it to Huangpu district. In that case, you need to do a tax audit, close down uh, all operations with the district tax bureau in Jing'an, and reopen and reapply um, for utilizing the tax services within Huangpu district. Jing'an district will not be happy because they're losing revenue, revenue dollars from you. And the whole process, when you're moving from one district to another, can take up to three months, if not four months, to complete. And when you're doing the audit or, or closure within that first tax district, let's say in Jing'an, um, it will mean that you cannot issue VAT invoices for that period of time. So changing your office address can result in your business being halted. So it's very important to know where you want to be located and in which district and try to stay within that district for the term of or, or the validity of your company in China. Moving from city to city. Unfortunately, every city in China has its own government bureaus, its own um, little government world. That if you want to move from Shanghai to Beijing or Wuhan to Wuxi or Hangzhou to Ningbo, in all of these scenarios, you need to close down in the first city and reopen the entity in the second city. Or alternatively, keep that entity in the original city and open a branch company in the new city. That would be the way of, of avoiding greater compliance requirements. Now, lately, we've been having a lot of um, uh, inquiries and providing a lot of services in relation to um, companies overseas changing the name of the shareholding entity. So let's say you have opened up a, a, a company in Shanghai. The shareholder of that Shanghai company is XYZ Germany Limited. This company, for whatever reasons, has now changed its name from XYZ Germany Limited to ABC Germany Limited. It's just changed the name. Hasn't even changed office addresses. You still need to file that name change with the Administration of Industry and Commerce and the MOFCOM in Shanghai. It requires an approval process. The difficulties we have had is that you need to prove to the MOFCOM and the AIC that the actual entity the shareholding entity has not changed, that it's not been sold, because otherwise they will see it as a transfer of shares. So this process really does become quite, quite complicated. Um, and as long as you have the documentation to back it up, it, it's, it's, it's okay. It just takes quite a lot of back and forth and discussion with the various government officers. Um, but just keep note that you, you do have to make that those changes um, within the local Shanghai government bureaus. Changes within the corporate structure. Now, changes within the corporate structure are actually really not complicated. But let me give you reasons why they can get complicated. So, whenever a company registers in China, they usually come to me, they tell me, uh, who actually should I choose to take on these roles and these positions. You know, and then you get questions like, do these people have to be residing in China? Do they not? Um, uh, is there any uh, requirement in terms of what position they're holding overseas, etc.? So let's go through them one by one. Um, the first key position in China is the legal representative. And this person is actually, once the company is incorporated, will be the signatory to all compliance changes that occur in the future of the company. 
Uh, they hold a certain liability if the company goes bankrupt or the bank, uh, the company is sued. The legal representative is the face of the company and is accountable for all of these issues. So quite a quite a hefty position. Who should that role and responsibility go to, go to? I, as a corporate service provider, or even your lawyers, they, they can't make that decision on your behalf. We can give you directions in that maybe you want it to be the chairman of your shareholding company, or you want it to be the division leader for China holding that position. But uh, ideally, it's somebody who is aware of and is planning all the targets and goals and objectives and is following the, the uh, progress of the China company. The board of directors and executive director, they are basically setting out the agenda of the company's operations. The general manager is then fulfilling those obligations. This is usually a person based in China, but it, again, it doesn't have to be who's on a day-to-day -day basis making sure everything is happening that the board of directors and executive director have set forth. All of these positions can be changed. They can be changed after six months, after one year, if someone has been fired, if someone has been terminated. Where does the problem lie? The problem lies in the fact that one, the application still takes about six to eight weeks to complete, and two, the former holder of that position and the new holder of that position have to sign documents. So if the former holder of that position has been fired, you might not find it so easy to get his signature. He might not be as cooperative as you would like him to be. Now, my tip in many of these scenarios is when you're incorporating your entity, try and have already signature pages available from every single individual in the corporate structure. Now, most companies don't like to do that. Um, usually, they are okay with it as long as their lawyer holds on to those documents and, and records when, when they're being used and when they're not being used. Now, for me, a key point is also, do these people have to reside in China or not? These people do not have to reside in China. So my recommendation, whenever you're going through the, the corporate structure and who should they, these people be, you really want to look at having people that are, have been long-term in your company, that are residing within the head office or the shareholding company, um, so that you can limit the quantity of times that you're doing these changes because it, it can actually get quite quite tedious quite tedious switching banks and changing bank signatories um, you can switch banks so basically if you open one day with uh, HSBC you can switch to Citibank or Bank of China or whomever um, if you uh, want to keep many sets of accounts you can also and then you start deterring it, but the banks may require you to do a formal closure procedure. Adding bank signatories, terminating bank signatories, you know, all of these scenarios will require either a face-to-face -face meeting with the legal representative or having the legal representative show his original passport, not necessarily with him there, um, or having the legal representative uh, sign off um, on the approvals that all of this can be done, that you can switch banks, that you can add bank signatories, that you can terminate bank signatories. Um, our experience with all of this is uh, honestly go to China, go to the city you want to locate in, meet with the banks yourself because in the majority of cases why companies are doing this is that they have not been impressed or they're not happy with um, the, the cooperation and the communication with the banks that they are currently working with. So go to China, visit with the banks, meet with them one-to-one, -one, and understand what services they offer so that you can try to limit the switching of banks and the changing of bank signatories. The changing of bank signatories is obviously critical if you are changing anybody in the corporate structure or just simply changing any of the bank signatories. Changing your business scope, again, something that you have to make sure if you do add any activities you update it within your business scope. Um, providing updates is not a problem at all. It takes approximately six to eight weeks. Um, there is an approval process with the AIC and the MOFCOM. Um, as I mentioned before, you can go and add activities from consulting to trading, trading to manufacturing. You can reduce activities, but it's very uncommon for a company to do that unless 
you're closing down your factory and you just want to be a simple trading company. That's, that's the main reason why you would downsize your business scope. Otherwise, even if you're just providing consulting services, you can still have trading in your, in your business scope even though you don't provide any trading services. Um, the broader your business scope, the better. So if you can from day one be as comprehensive as possible with all the activities you want to do, that's obviously much better. With each activity, you have to analyze whether additional licenses are required. Um, and then again, that should be, uh, you should know that at the start of your operation, but even if you want to update your business scope, know it at that time whether additional licenses are required as well. Applications to increase register capital or transfer foreign debt loan. So when you want to um, do any type of transaction with foreign capital, you generally need to require approval from the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. The State Administration of Foreign Exchange is going to check that whenever you do a renminbi conversion, uh, renminbi to USD, renminbi to Euro, renminbi to Hong Kong dollar, or vice versa, uh, they're going to check the transaction, they're going to check the agreements, the contracts, um, and uh, give an approval whether you can go ahead and do that. Now, in your Articles of Association, you're stating that you have a registered capital amount, you have a total investment amount. People do tend to not calculate that correctly, um, and they spend more money than actually what is coming into the company. And as a, as a consequence, they cannot sustain themselves. Now, there are a variety of ways to make sure that you have capital to sustain yourself. One of these methods is to increase your registered capital and total investment. The whole process takes about eight weeks, if not more. Um, you need to also get approval from your bank, and the capital would have to then go into your capital account before it can be utilized into your settlement accounts. Registered capital is utilized as working capital, meaning that it's money that goes into your company right from the start, and for me, it's really your startup capital. It's capital you're using to pay off um, office rent, salaries, uh, uh, any type of, of marketing expenditure. Um, all your startup costs that are associated with your operation will be paid through your, through your registered capital. Now, Another method besides increasing your registered capital and your total investment is to utilize your foreign debt loan. When you are transferring money into your company, you are transferring the registered capital amount. But there's also a total investment capital amount, which is indicated in your Articles of Association. And that amount is calculated through a ratio calculation. Now, the difference between your total investment capital and your registered capital amount is what is called foreign debt loan in China. It's important to note that the typical loans that you know in the Western world, that, that doesn't really exist in China unless you're getting a local loan from a bank. It is not easy for your foreign company, your shareholding company, or even a third party or a sister company or even a foreign bank to loan capital to your China entity. It all, all that money has to flow through the shareholding company. So even if you get a loan from a bank in Europe, the bank in Europe has to give the money to the shareholding company before the shareholder can transfer it to the Chinese company. Now the foreign debt loan is the difference between the registered capital amount and the total investment, account, uh, investment capital. The advantage of this is that this, this amount, this foreign debt loan, can be transferred immediately without approval uh, into the capital account. Uh, it can be utilized and it can be paid back if you would want it to be paid back. Now, all uh, uh, foreign debt loans do have to be registered with the state of, of um, administration of foreign exchange, um, but it, it is a simpler method of, of being able to get cash quickly if needed. You can apply for loans locally in China. That is a discussion you should have with your bank. So as I recommended, go to China, meet with banks. That should be one of your questions. Can you get credit lines? Can you get loans? Can you apply for loans overseas? Yes, you can, but as I men mentioned, you have this flow of cash that needs to go through the shareholding company. Now, last couple of slides. 
annual compliance procedures. Um, for me, this is a critical slide that I hope everybody takes away from today because really um, there are basically six steps, seven if you're profitable in China, um, where uh, they flow one after another between January 1st and June 30th of every year. Um, these are critical steps that have to be completed with all the various government bureaus. So the first step one is you have to complete your year and financial management reports. So, you know, 90% or 95% of all companies in China have a fiscal year, which is January to December. That means that your December reports and completing your year end financial management reports needs to be done relatively quickly in January. You're going to have then Chinese New Year and immediately after or if you're lucky before Chinese New Year, you do step two, which is the annual audit. You need to uh, make sure you uh, choose your auditor, preferably before the year end, so that you have your date scheduled for your audits, um, and the annual audit uh, reports are then issued. By March 31st, you have to do the annual individual income tax filing. By April 30th, you have to do the annual profits tax filing. By June 30th, you have to do the annual inspection, annual report. After that is completed, you can do business license or registration certificate renewals. The business license registration certificate renewals will really depend on the term of validity of your license. And the last step, if you are profitable, would be the application for dividend repatriation, if you want to repatriate dividends. The repatriation of dividends can only occur once a year and they can only occur once all your annual compliance procedures have been complete. So it's important to understand um, all of these steps and the flow that they come in. Now I want to provide some tips for preparing and maintaining documentation in China because if some of you have gone through the process of incorporating your entity, you know by now that the amount of documents is just crazy. And to maintain all of those documents and understand all the procedures and the history that's occurred uh, can be quite tedious. So the first is understand, and especially for the foreign investor that's located overseas, understand that all application forms, all documents are only submitted in Chinese language. It's a disadvantage to everybody we know, but that is a requirement no matter where you're located. We do recommend that translations are provided so you at least know what you're signing. Um, but the English versions are usually yours, right? So you also want to make sure that the translations that are done are, are well done. Be prepared to sign numerous copies. There are a number of government bureaus where documents have to be submitted. Um, even though today you have the 5-in-1 business license, you have to provide the uh, MOFCOM and AIC with a series of documents, a, ser uh, 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 a high quantity per document um, because they are going to distribute it internally to the various bureaus. So just be prepared of, of getting a pile of documents that requires your signature. You need to sign all documents with a black ink pen. Um, no matter what application you are doing, you have to sign with a black ink pen. Sounds ridiculous, I know, but if you would sign with a red pen, green pen, blue pen, it will not be accepted. If you sign with any type of ballpoint pen, even a black one, it will be rejected. You have to sign with a black ink pen. Remember how the people within the corporate structure as well as the authorized signatory have signed their documents. Now my recommendation is to sign the documents according to the signature that is in your passport. In this way, you always have something to fall back on in case you've forgotten how, to, how you've signed the documents. Know that it's always going to be the passport signature. Everybody, every single individual has slight variations with their signatures. If you have a slight variation which does not match what has been put inside the computer system of the Administration of Industry and Commerce, your application will be rejected and you will have to re-sign the whole pile of documents again. Now, this follows with bank accounts and bank signatories. Again, if you are a bank signatory, try and follow the signature that is in your passport because 
Anyhow, you have to submit your passport and passport copy. Try and keep all the signatures the same as your passport so you know which signature you're using. And that will help you with the banks and it will also help you then with any compliance procedures that have to occur. Note that in some cities, applications are done online, which is fantastic, saves up a lot of time. In other cities, the applications are old school, um, where things have to be filed in person, by hand, with, with printable documents. Um, with the new regulations of, of, um, of uh, investment, of the investment law, now with MOFCOM, all of the, uh, the first application is done online. Um, it's called a record filing, and a confirmation of the record filing can be obtained, which is a key point so that you know at what step you are in, uh, in the application process for any procedure, whether setup of your company or all after compliance procedures. It's important to keep all approved and amended articles of associations. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, this, there, there is no requirement in China or anybody checking if you are keeping these documents on hand, um, but they are critical if you want to do any further changes. Uh, again, there's no requirement to file um, board resolutions or amendments. I mean, this is something you have to do internally, which is why I do recommend you can name this person whatever you like. I call it a compliance officer because for me, um, it, it gives me a very clear idea of what one of their responsibilities would be. The compliance officer is required to keep track of all the documentation, of all the changes that have occurred, etc. Um, you should really appoint someone to hold that position, whether you do it in-house or whether you do it externally through your lawyer, your corporate service provider, or whomever you entrust um, to handle all of this. Now, we've just hit uh, 6 o'clock, so all the questions that have come in, I am going to answer you personally um, after this webinar session, so please wait for, for my emails. If any of you others have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Happy to help you um, in an, any situation or scenario that you might be in. Please note that we have two more sessions left um, in this 10-part webinar series. Uh, tomorrow it will be about anti-bribery and anti-corruption, and on Friday we're talking about how to exit the Chinese market successfully. If you are interested in any of those two webinars, please do register for them. And last but not least, if you are interested in subscribing to our free uh, e-newsletter, it can be done so on our homepage by inserting your email in the section called China Invest.biz Information Series. I want to thank everybody for joining me today. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you again very soon. I hope we could be of some help today, and I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you and goodbye.